Uh, welcome to our August edition of our Kentucky K-12 CIO at Tech Leaders Webcast. I'm David Couch with the Kentucky Department of Education. Uh, for the new folks uh, joining us, both in our uh, Office of Education Technology staff, OET, and districts, uh, this is something we do once a month uh, with, with all the districts across the state. Um, this is our opportunity to share some information, but also to get some feedback and share with you what's going on, just not at a district level, but state level, but uh, but national level. We also have Go Soapbox and sent you that link this morning. Uh, we have some poll questions that we would like um, uh, you to respond to. And um, as we go along through the uh, through the webcast, uh, we'll we'll um, we'll identify some of those to uh, to bring up. Um, uh, first up, though, I'd like just to welcome everyone. I think most districts, and tell me if I'm wrong, have besides the ones obviously impacted by the the floods, which we'll spend some time with, have uh, open or getting very close to opening. Uh, so welcome back to, to school and all the fun parts associated with that. I don't know what school year this is for me of coming back. Obviously, this is the 31st school year with the Department of Education, but I had a lot of school years before that that should count as well. So um, rounding up to close to 50, probably uh, school year somehow involved with this uh, in, in some kind of way. So uh, welcome, welcome everyone to the beginning of the school year. Uh, I did want to take some time to um, reflect back and talk about um, and discuss the ed education technology related items um, uh, that that happened with the recent uh, recent floods um, and with you know things going forward, but also just the um, just the things that have happened within the past two years. We've had a pandemic, a once, supposedly a once in a lifetime pandemic, supposedly once in a lifetime um, you know uh, tornadoes, particularly in December timeframe, supposedly once in a lifetime floods. Uh, all three of those have happened within uh, the past two years. And so what are the what are the things we can learn from that from education technology perspective? Obviously, I know from the personal perspective what that what that means and what folks are dealing with. Uh, I actually have family that live in Knott County and Perry County and Letcher. These are first cousins and aunts and uncles and uh, have property in Breathitt County. Uh, I know the devastation that's happened to those areas that will take many, many years. Um, uh, there's some immediate, immediate things being done. Uh, obviously, it will take uh, years, five, ten years uh, to um, really get that back. And obviously, there'll be some things that never come back. Uh, and that's what happens with these types of things. But we're we're seeing people, you know, work together to make some some good things happen for others. As I as I reflect back uh, over the past two years, um, and it takes me back to the tornadoes in December and and, and um, interacting with those districts and what we've done through the pandemic and now the floods, I think about what has gone well, what has positioned our districts to to uh, um, do fairly well during uh, supposedly once in a lifetime types of things. I would say the the first item and I would encourage anyone else to, you know, you can, um, um, you know, jump in here. Um, is relationships. I think relationships is key to any kind of success that you have. Um, and as I always say, you ideally want to have relationships uh, established before you need them, uh, not just when you need them. Uh, and so uh, as I think back over the past two years, um, the relationships our staff, uh, particularly our field staff, but other parts of our staff that have with districts um, have given us um, a great insight to what's going on in the districts very quickly and being able to address them where we could at, at the KD level. And obviously in the district and between districts, you also have great relationships and and those have been occurring for decades that really have, have come through. I I think about what happened in, in Western Kentucky with the tornadoes and now in Eastern Kentucky, the relationship that our field staff member has with the district uh, got us a pretty good, pretty good picture of the impact of the school district themselves. And, and be honest with you, better than any other part of KDE, uh, that we knew what had been impacted, what services has been impacted, um, but also from a personal level. Uh, you, you'll probably recall that the very first thing that we asked is, is how are you all doing? Uh, is your staff, first of all, okay physically? And obviously we know X percent of the staff got impacted personally, uh, of the technology staff. And, and then we went on to take a look at the stuff uh, which obviously is, is a much second in priority to the education technologies, things that we have in place. But those have really 
turned out to be pretty key because it gave us insight of the specific areas that were impacted. And therefore, we could pretty quickly start coordinating uh, to get those services back up and operational very quickly, because just not from an educational standpoint, uh, as most of you have been through a disaster know, is the school is a kind of place where people come just to kind of huddle up. Their, their home has been wiped out. Uh, something has happened. And so home with school buildings and churches and other places like that where people go when there's nowhere else to go. And so they become emergency command centers, uh, which happened in Breathitt County, uh, the emergency command center that's that's in place there. And so it happened in Mayfield. People were wandering around. I can remember the superintendent talking to us just a few days after it happened that people were still wandering around, stuff totally gone. But they, they had a, a safe place to come inside the school building, uh, which was not uh, impacted very severely. And so for our perspective is, is um, it's just not the educational perspective that we take a look at the school buildings being up and operational, but just the community perspective of a place to go until it can get it somewhat stabilized in those areas. And those relationships have really helped uh, us um, and helped you all uh, dur during these uh, once in a lifetime, three separate once in a lifetime types of things that have happened. The other thing that we've done right, um, and I would say in comparison to other states, but just done right, is the cloud services that we have in place um, and being mo the mobility. Uh, one of the greatest feelings that um, we could offer to the tornado victims in, in Western Kentucky was they could get paid on time. Because if you go back in the early days of Munis, for example, most of you know Munis was uh, the servers within a school district. Um, and if the districts were doing backups and a very high percentage were not, uh, to be honest with you, I want to say it's 80, 90 percent. We're not doing backups of their data. If the district office, wherever they house that got wiped out, it was gone. Um, and if they were doing backups, typically it was pretty close location, uh, maybe even their house. And we know in the case of the floods, um, there's a very high percentage of the homes that got hit as well. So if there was a backup there, it would have been gone. So by having, for example, the financial management system in the cloud, we could ensure that the people going through something horrendous in Western Kentucky could be paid on time, uh, that the school staff members, the same thing happens in Eastern Kentucky. Uh, you can make assurances that they would be paid on time, uh, which is a wonderful thing in the mix of all the chaos that, that, that folks are going through. So the mobility and the ability to do things from different locations versus one location being wiped out is really big a player in disaster recovery and we call continuity of operations. The third part I think is important and it comes into play even the situation we have in Eastern Kentucky is a current inventory of the items that you have. Obviously, you know, in the digital readiness report and the other types of things that you do once a year, uh, you provide an inventory of the counts and numbers of what you have. And that comes in really handy in these situations right here where you've had X percentage of a school or a school district wiped out because what happens soon afterward and People are dealing with the chaos of just what people are going through at homes. People are wanting to help. And so those that are in Western Kentucky uh, and now Eastern Kentucky know that, uh, you know, the humanity is stepping out and wanting to help them. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, they don't really just not sure what to donate. Uh, I can remember even in the flood in Johnson County and Flat Gap, uh, where, I, where I grew up at, um, there was a massive flood that wiped out um, a lot of homes there. And what I remember going to Johnson Central High School and seeing all these clothes stacked up. And it's true they needed clothes in the early stages. But really what they needed more so at that stage they were currently at was Clorox and garbage bags and shovels. Uh, and so that's what was needed. So it changes uh, the, the, the level of the emergency changes. Um, but we getting in at the, also at the same time, people are trying to say, well, what can I give you when you kind of go back? And we know, you know, this, uh, the donations thing has a shot clock on it, unfortunately. People, when it happens, are, are helpful and they send things, but there's a tendency after a short period of time, they forget about it. And these kind of disasters we've had in Western Kentucky and now Eastern Kentucky, they're years, they're five or 10 year type of things. Uh, so you want to really try to be, um, have the things in place that you need, even though you're dealing with a lot of the chaos. So these folks that are willing to donate money, uh, and anything else, you can give them somewhat of a swag, um, an estimate of what you need. 
And so that's where the inventories come into play and nothing's going to be 100 percent, 100 percent perfect. But I think that's that's something that 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 uh, that, that comes up positive. Um, the other one that, that has come up positive in both all three, all three of them, the pandemic. And then the um, uh, the tornadoes in West Kentucky, now the floods is our um, Kentucky K-12 Internet services. Um, if we take a look at all that, and I think about, you know, even Breathitt County to where there was nothing working. There was no internet. There was no phone system working in Breathitt County except the internet link that we had uh, with Kentucky K-12's internet link coming into Breathitt County, which turned into an emergency command center. They all stayed up 100% of the time um, during that, during during the flood period time. Even, um, you know, uh, even in Letcher County, which took extensive um, hits to their uh, facilities. Um, all stayed up 100% of the time. And if you take a look back for those that went through the, the, the situations in, in Western Kentucky, the Mayfield, the Dawson Springs, the Bowling Green, the other areas that it, that it hit, you know, our hub services were up and available. And then we were quickly trying to see how quickly can we get back the school, connect, the, the school connections and some of those schools have been, you know, had the, the lines wiped out as we were facing it in, in um, Eastern Kentucky. And we're quick, you know, we're working with those providers or to get the school buildings back up. And then in some cases, we're going to have temporary facilities um, uh, for these folks to go to and how quickly can we get them connected to the KD Internet Hub and the services we have in place. I think the other important part is just being mobile. Um, even here in Kentucky state government, KD was really the only agency I can think of that was ready, ready for the pandemic. Uh, and, um, 99.99% of the staffing here had mobile computers ahead of time. What I didn't realize is a very high percentage of Kentucky state government had desktop computers and that was intentional. They wanted, didn't want to be mobile. So what this has proven in all three situations is the importance of having a mobile mindset uh, as much as possible because you, you don't know where you're going to be at. You don't know where you need to take the things at um, and temporarily or full time. And I think mobile has, has, has served us um, uh, extremely well. Um, as we take a look at what we learned in the pandemic, uh, and even you know following that as things stabilized in December 2021 uh, with the tornadoes and now um, in July of uh, 22, is much like uh, Marty, we presented to the board about full time, um, you know, full time for remote uh, and, and virtual instruction. Even as situations just happened in East Kentucky, we realized that an extremely high percentage under what in-person instruction. Uh, we don't believe that, a, 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 you know, while it can play a role for the parents that wanted that even before this happened, we don't think virtual or remote is going to be a big player at all. Maybe a one or two or three percent type of thing. Uh, if anything that says is we want in person, but for those that for whatever reason, uh, you know, want a virtual option that, you know, that's obviously the service is up and available. Uh, but we know the limitations that are associated with that, but it's, it's uh, you can say it's better than nothing and it's definitely improved. But we feel that even the districts that have been impacted um, as virtual is not really a super option. And we have opening dates pretty soon for uh, four of the five uh, uh, districts that were most impacted um, uh, with the really only Electric County. And Electric County was, um, uh, that, you know, the devastation that hit with them, both their homes and their schools. Um, uh, does not allow them to do a date, date at this time. Um, and, you know, there was a difference between uh, what happened with tornadoes, the swath that the tornadoes hit, you know, going at some points a mile wide in different different locations. It was somewhat um, uh, contained to those areas. You know, what happened in East Kentucky was, you know, you have eight, nine, ten inches of rain in an hour period countywide. Every, every creek filling up, and then the water backing up because it has nowhere to go. Um, and so it's different in the cast of the breadth that it hit. And I also think the bread, the bridges and the infrastructure, uh, now we have a family farm in Breathitt County. My grandfather built a swinging bridge and I always got to explain what a swinging bridge is. I always assume people know what that is, but they don't. Uh, my grandfather built that swinging bridge in the 1930s. Um, and what it allowed is when you have a low water bridge, which we do to our property, to my grandparents' property, but the water, and it didn't take a flood, gets over that bridge. So you have the ability to walk across, and it's a really long, for those that are not familiar with them, they're really long, and they do swing. And you can have someone on there swinging them. Um, uh, but it allowed you to 
keep from being water, you know, waterlocked, in, in landlocked, uh, and you could walk across there. So my grandfather's bridge, along with our neighbor's bridge, which was our backup, both got wiped out uh, during the pandemic. Um, and so if that level, it shows you that level high since 1930, it's never gotten that high to where it wiped that out. We know the infrastructure, uh, you know, will take long, long time uh, to, to get uh, to get built back up again. So districts are trying to work around um, their, their ability for their students to get to their schools. So even though the schools are opening, is the infrastructure available for them to even reach there? Um, and, and Mayfield and Dawson Springs work to, uh, together to where even though the students may be temporarily living in another county, they were bused in uh, to their home district. Um, and, you know, a lot of the thought process is, just so you know, if you've never gone through this, is uh, both we found, if you listen to, by the way, the superintendents, I'm not covering all the things the superintendents do beyond technology, uh, because the superintendents have a meeting every Thursday, and that's on our KD Media Portal if you want to uh, listen to that. But they, they talk about the widespread types of things that they must consider uh, beyond the district, but just the, the technology portion is hit. Uh, hit, hit just a little bit. The other thing I'd like to hit on is the, the temporary buildings. Um, so obviously uh, for a school uh, site, uh, if you've had a school recently hit, it's not gonna be able to open. Folks that are, are that understandably are unwilling to put a temporary building right beside it. Um, even FEMA is unwilling to do that uh, because of the ability to hit, uh, be hit. So what we'll be faced with um, with some of these districts is a temporary building, not right beside the existing one that got hit, uh, or you know, in, in a location that's not there. And in one location, and, and for the area technology centers, it, um, it it's looking like. And, and Courtney, I sent you the note this morning uh, that it may be and um, the hazard uh, KCTCS uh, will will house a, you know a certain amount of students uh, for a period of time, maybe for six months or a year. And so we'll be working with them on what's the best setup. The good lesson learned from the pandemic is we work very closely with Franklin County Schools. They had a situation to where their district office had to be shut for a period of time. And so their staff came to our Sour Building uh, here in Frankfurt, and we uh, were able to come up with a design to make it look like they were sitting right in their school district. And so I suspect with KCTS team, the KCTCS team will be working and with them and trying to set up a similar structure to where it looks like it, it's working with uh, it's within that district. We'll have to give some thought to uh, the computers they use uh, in KCTCS and how we do the internet content management. That's re that's a re that's a requirement. So uh, this afternoon at 3 p.m., um, myself and Courtney and Courtney's been Courtney DeRoss in East Kentucky has been great staying on top of this and working with the districts there along with working with each other. We have a conversation with organizations that that uh, provide uh, either temporary uh, or you know loaner computers or full-time you know kind of computers in a pinch. Um, and so, Courtney, I got your update. Like in Knott County, getting X number, and I think Letcher County got X number. So you have to get some thought as we have that conversation this afternoon at 3 p.m. on the numbers that we're asking for. Um, now I just didn't give them big categories to to work with. And you got to hit the fire pretty pretty quickly because the donors, you know, start going to their next thing. Uh, the priority is for the school-owned equipment. That's priority A1. Um, obviously, you know, districts have a pretty good handle on that. Tier two we talk about is um, uh, personally owned. So for families that have lost it, and we know that teachers took these computers home. Uh, the the, you know, the good news is, you know, for the most part. Districts had the um, the school owned computers in the school building. They hadn't had them out yet. Um, and particularly for a school that had 60% of their homes uh, wiped out or impacted, uh, that would have lost 60%. But obviously the teachers that had them uh, had them impacted in that county or in the county they work someplace else, uh, but they work for that other district had it wiped out. So uh, nothing's gonna be 100% perfect with this. You're just trying to get an area, but I see there are other people willing to donate uh, computers for a period of time. And, you know, the other thing that comes into play, just a lesson learned with this, what people ask is insurance typically covers replacement of technology items. And so what's typically comes up in these discussions, well, the insurance is going to replace it. Why do you really need these? Well, it takes time. And all you have dealt with personal insurance to go through the whole gamut of applying for personal insurance, 
getting it approved, the battle that usually goes back and forth with that, and then getting it approved and then ordering it and getting it in. So the reason we're working, trying to get something very temporarily, if nothing else, um, used, you know, these may be used or refurbished, is uh, just to have them something to start the school year, uh, to buy some time as a new equipment, as they go through the insurance, you know, battle and get that the money approved, um, and the time it takes to get them in, new ones will be coming in uh, to replace the technology that's been lost. But that's the uh, that's what comes into play when you're 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 going down uh, this path. Um, see, is there anything else that uh, anyone else would like to share in a lesson learned? And I and once again, it's just a I want the narrow focus be education, technology focus. Once again, if you want to, the the bigger discussion, you can you can follow up with that. You know, happens in the superintendent's discussion about what's happening and the devastation that's happened there. So. Really for us, our focus is uh, we know the, the the KD internet link in every district is up and operational. It's um, how do we connect the 10 schools, the five schools out of our 1500, either they're, they're in a temporary location uh, to the, the KD internet hub or, or do it in another manner, in a temporary manner. Uh, anything else that someone would like to add around this topic? I'll just look at the comments here. Okay. And we have a discussion question, which I haven't looked at in Ghost Soapbox, um, just around this. And I know the the district's hey, going. Good, good feedback out there on that question, by the way, that you put out there. Yeah. Okay. Let me look. So the uh, I know the district's going through this. Um, um, we'll have some lessons learned. Uh, they're they're dealing with the chaos of the situation of meeting with folks right now. Um, and, you know, Mayfield, Dawson Springs and Bowling Green can definitely sympathize um, with that. Uh, the technology wise, it was just what people are going through personally on their staff and their district and then the parents themselves. Um, so they'll probably have some more extensive lessons learned for us on it. So let me see if I'm, I'll look at it here. Let's see here, the need for redundancy. You can back up things. I'm just looking at your comments here in the Go Soapbox. Jason. David, I really, really appreciate and love Jason's comment, um, kind of following some of the, the guidance that you have uh, kind of walked through, but they understand personal attention must be, you know, individual and personal health and safety first. Um, and then once that's established, then focus on family and community and then education. Yeah. You know, you know, the other stuff that uh, I noticed, and this came up, unfortunately, you get to be an expert in these areas, uh, you don't want to be an expert in them, is initially, and you know, I had, you know, a, a, you know, family members that are impacted by this, you know, the, the flood was coming on both sides of their house. I had an aunt that didn't want to leave because she's afraid someone would take her lawnmower, look, get out of the house, you know, but they literally didn't have time to put, you know, because it was coming so quickly, um, shoes and clothes on, they had to get out of the house. Uh, and, and, you know, thankfully they did. They're all OK, at least on our family side. But, you know, their homes and personal things are. So it is initially with with clothes uh, and then there is the cleaning stuff. But Mayfield and Dawson Springs and Bowling Green would tell you uh, and their superintendents, by the way, have been awesome sharing their lessons learned with Eastern Kentucky superintendents during those meetings. Um, money donations are very helpful and districts have, you know, the thing we learned from uh, the Western Kentucky districts is the districts need to put up on their own websites what kind of things need to be donate, donated, which I think all the sites have done so far, and that's uh, been good. But typically, it's money uh, really helps the districts um, uh, in the longer term uh, versus the clothes and the Clorox, because those all go through phases that sometimes they need the money that's directed toward the recovery. So, um, uh, yeah, and, and obviously, even though the, as well prepared as you can be, you can't always prepare for the, the horrific, you know, what's happened in, in, uh, in these sites, but what can we do ahead of time? And there's there's some things that have well, you know, we, you know, we get five stars on uh, for coming through in this and, and uh, yeah. Um, all right, uh, move on to the next item, uh, results of the Kentucky Board of Education meeting. Um, I did spend uh, time and it's a good thing for once a year, kind of going to give the education technology update uh, to our uh, to our board of education members. 
Um, I always, I always uh, appreciate that opportunity. Uh, I took time to highlight our, his, you know, our um, historic achievements in the timeline, the Kets timeline, uh, which uh, one of our board members, uh, Vice Chair, uh, held up and said this was great um, um, because it really lays out over the course of time the significant achievements that have happened even within a year's time frame. Uh, so I think it's important to do that, give them the infographic. Um, and lay out about you know this is the most funding te education technology funding that we've ever had close to half a billion dollars going into this school year and the next school year i did lay out very uh, bluntly um, that the issue we have is not this coming school year or the next one it's the funding cliff of 240 million 280 million going into the school year 24 25 uh, and this is the time to uh, do things and and, and you know it going on at the same time to address that. You know, one is to get it on the Kentucky Board of Education priorities, uh, which they know, I, I said, my ask of them is to make it a top five priority. Our Board of Education has been very successful over the very past few years. When it becomes a Board of Education top priority, it tends to get, get funded. The next step is to make sure in the next governor's office budget, it's a, it's a priority and, and, and in there. Um, the next one is to work with the K groups that are out there, uh, Kentucky School Board Associates, Kentucky Associates School Superintendents, um, uh, um, the all, all the other K groups that are that are out there. Um, and, and I'm missing a few there. Um, school administrators, you know, Kentucky Associates School Administrators that are out there, CASA. So um, uh, all those ones that are out there to make sure it's on their top five, uh, which it wasn't this last uh, legislative session. Um, the other one is a strategy with with you all um, of someone in the district uh, um, making it a priority to reach out to these legislators to say this is important. This needs to be a top five funding priority, uh, given the funding cliff that we have reached and then the lack of the KETS funds, you know, uh, not being raised since 19, uh, really 1992, uh, where it was 19.5 million then, it's 15.4 million now. There will be serious consequences two years from now uh, to you all and the offers of assistance if that's not if that's not addressed. And it's also a concern of the bandwidth speeds that we have now of uh, being able to maintain those. And so the, the, the issues are very real. Uh, and uh, a great model for us is the Family Resource Youth Service Centers are the champions of keeping things from being cut and getting additional funding. They got it together. And what that means is all these folks in the districts work together collectively with a voice to make things a top priority. And somehow we got to get that in K-12 ed tech with our districts. Um, obviously, KD will do their portion on working with legislators one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. You know, I've uh, already talked with our legislative liaison and our, our commissioner, who is very receptive of one-on-one -on -one meeting with legislators early on, getting in front of committees. Um, and getting on their radar screen um, and making it receptive. But this is a, a multi-prong effort. And the reason I'm talking to you all is um, there's that old saying that you can have a vision, but if you don't have uh, money to go along with your vision, it's a hallucination. So we don't want to be hallucinating. So we need the funding um, uh, that is there to sustain the excellence that we have because you know, one thing I will share, you know, I'll get to my lessons learned from our, my meeting with other states around the United States that happened last uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. Kentucky K-12 truly is, uh, uh, we, we're going to need a, someone to mute someone there. Um, I'll just pause there, try to find out who's speaking. I think it's Gary Bachman. Yeah, I got it. Yeah, thank you. Yep, yeah. we're good to go. Good, good. thank you. Um, but I'll just I'll just circle back. It's a team effort to try to get this this funded, and it, it's a sense of urgency that you all make it a um, a, a top priority um, to try to get this on the radar screen. And it and you can't wait the last second with 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 all this. And uh, obviously, Katie will do do its effort to try to do something about it. But we count on the districts to do it as well. Um, I did find the board was receptive uh, receptive to that. Um, Next up is we uh, we did get the um, um, our um, the the board kind of aware of the overall budget and approving at least the KETS funds are associated with that. Uh, the next step 
uh, I believe in September, I don't know the date in September, we meet with the School Facility Construction Commission. Um, usually early in September, that's the other step that has to occur before the CATS offers of assistance go out. And um, so that, that that's on its way. The other thing, Marty, I'll let you cover is uh, uh, our presentation to the board on full-time remote and virtual instruction. I think it, if you talk to it in this way too, is a team effort that across KDE that presented that. Um, so thanks. Yes, thank you, David. Um, so we we had the opportunity and and we've touched on it over the past uh, five or six months on our EdTech Leaders webcasts, and we actually had the topic of full time enrolled online virtual and remote students uh, in our last CIO summit as well. And so all of that feedback built into this co super collaborative effort um, where it was not just a uh, partnership with you as school district leaders, with your superintendents, uh, with your local boards, uh, but also um, every office uh, in in the agency in the Kentucky Department of Education, and um, a really great collaborative effort to ensure that the regulation that we put in front of the KBE um, hit on all of the areas that we knew were valuable, and that we knew that we needed to provide. Uh, so not just to provide an opportunity for K through 12 students, um, but also the funding mechanism to, to make it the right design uh, for you as, as school districts have asked for and as your superintendents have asked for. So um, really great opportunity is also recognized by our, our Board of Ed um, of how uh, interactive uh, that was, um, as well as the process of our board giving feedback and then us providing the additional information and addi additional design elements for them to feel confident that uh, unanimously voting uh, to approve the proposed regulation language uh, was exactly what what they needed to do. And um, so it's it a really great experience, um, but it all, it's also really good work by a lot of uh, uh, folks who really went heads down to make sure that we got the right um, components. Uh, together. So, so as David mentioned, our, our board um, unanimously approved the proposed regulation that's 704 KAR uh, 3 colon 535. Um, and that is for full time enrolled online virtual and remote students. Um, it's, it's not uh, taking away opportunities for, um, for virtual performance based designs that we know many, many school districts, I think the percentage is 80 some percent of school districts are leveraging for supplemental course pickups and things like that. Um, but this is for um, an attendance based approach, which we know the funding mechanism is a bit different. Um, and superintendents have given strong feedback that um, that's the kind of funding mechanism that works uh, for, for them and that, that kind of design works for you in that design. So our board approved the regulation. Um, as proposed for the start and it would start in the 23 24 school year um, and so david as you mentioned the the statement of consideration process then has officially begun we have a on october 25th we have a public hearing um, and so depending on the amount of comments submitted um, we will the, the kde will summarize those comments and will offer a response which may or may not result in uh, tweaking the proposed regulation. Um, generally, our experience in the past is that uh, with with the regulations that we have moved forward that has not resulted in uh, any type of, you know, edits or tweaking. And so we'll we'll take that and then it goes off to the General Assembly um, and specifically the the administrative administrative regulation review subcommittee, the ARS committee, um, where they will have a hearing and they'll vote to ratify the regulation at that point. So the 22-23 the school year that we are in right now, the um, waiver process that we have in place, um, right now 60 districts, 60, I wanna say 63 or 64 districts are taking uh, um, advantage of right now. Um, that will end at the end of this school year and then provided everything goes as planned, then the, this new regulation will pick up in the 23-24 school year. Um, David, we, we do have a, yeah, box box question. yeah, yeah, yeah. Bring that up. I, yeah, I thought that was pretty good. I'm looking at the responses and, and once again, encouraging folks to log on and give your your feedback to it. So this this supports what we presented to the board, Marty. I think that um, 
we said the overwhelming amount that we felt um, would be one, you know, one to two percent, and you see none is a pretty good chunk there, and uh, one to two percent uh, above that. And I, I don't imagine it's greatly above that, uh, one or two percent, but uh, eight percent would fall in that this, in that category. This is great feedback. Um, yeah. You know, with fifty-one responses, um, and again. As they've just said, you know, try to jump into Soapbox and give feedback on all the questions. But with 51 responses, this sits exactly where we um, have projected. And we, we also know, and, and it's important, again, in alignment with these responses, David, that in the 22-23 uh, school year, um, the districts that we have that have applied for the waiver are um, about half of what applied for the waiver in the 21-22 school year. And so we're getting to um, a set of districts that, um, you know, this is one of those, we called it the stickiness factor from pandemic response that are moving forward uh, for districts who um, have a design that they feel like is working for their, their students. I will, I will point out also that, um, you know, we had great response from school district superintendents through our, our LSAC, our local superintendents advisory that, um, the, the percentage of districts who feel like this type of opportunity or design, um, especially when wrapped with high quality, uh, is, is really an opportunity to regain or retain uh, students and families that are thinking about homeschool. And we know that that's a, actually KET is, is getting ready to air a, a special with our commissioner um, and other education leaders across state, including a few superintendents that, that are talking about this kind of issue of um of students that we're trying to find across the state so yeah, yeah thanks david this is this is a great topic to continue to move forward yeah so did, did, did you know, be aware of the other groups we marty and i presented this not only to the board of education uh with the other team members but also look local, local superintendents advisory council gave your unanimous thumbs up to it marty also presented to the all the co-op directors once a week kd has the opportunity to meet with the uh, different co-op directors across state. Was there any kind of feedback from that? Because I know you had that discussion with them, you and Ben. Yeah, that that was that ben Maynard, actually yesterday. Ben Maynard, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So I was going to share uh, Ben Maynard on our team in OET, um, which many of you online know. Um, he is helping lead this effort. Um, he's the brains behind a lot of this work. <laughs> um, but we we had the opportunity to share with co-op directors yesterday in their once a month uh meet up with uh katie and that's led by our chief academic officer mickey ray um great discussion we shared the the process we shared the uh administrative regulation and what's interesting and what's important is our co-op directors are also trying to figure out how they help uh each and every school district that they work with so some of our school districts um have full-time enrolled online virtual programs, obviously. Um, and then some of our school districts are not planning to, but would need or need a kind of regional hub approach. And we now have three uh, education cooperatives who are trying to figure out and have a, and, and two of which have already launched a program that are more of a regional hub approach for districts that are not planning to have a program internally, but need uh, opportunities for students to take advantage of. And so great discussion, lots of really good questions. Um, targeting the 23-24 school year, we will have a, a program guide that goes with the administrative regulation as well as additional supports. Last thing I'll, I'll share, which uh, the uh, education cooperative directors uh, touched on yesterday, and we're really excited about the, the new a new network that is developing. Um, it's a people, a leadership network um, and a learning network, not a not a technology network um, that is developing that is being led by KET. Um, it's it's leveraging uh, federal ESSER funds that are pulling um, our online and virtual programs together so that we get better together and we focus on high quality together, keeping in mind that this is not you know, emergency reaction types of, you know, students behind a screen and, and we hope think good things happen. This is uh, real high quality design that folks are after, so. Thanks, Marty. Uh, yeah. Mike, uh, update on any of the RFPs that uh, want to make, we want to make districts aware of. <clears throat> yeah, um, David, let me first uh, 
uh, speak real quickly to the offers. You mentioned the offers, obviously, as part of what was presented to the state board. So I want to remind folks that our intention is to have those offers moving by early October. Uh, essentially, there's a 60 day window once we start that process. And, and I really want that 60 day window to end before we get into the uh, Christmas holiday break. We kind of had a lesson learned last year that created some difficulty whenever that 60 day window ended up flowing into the holiday time. So our goal will be to have that first offer in process by the uh, 1st of October. And as we've said before, the overall offer will be $21 per ADA. Um, and uh, that first offer, uh, we, it should be between nine and 12. We're gonna do two offers. We're back, I think everybody understands we're back to, we're doing two offers a year. Uh, and again, that first offer will be between nine and 12 depending on uh, ready available funds, which we've got to look at a few things yet before I can commit to what uh, what we want that dollar amount to be for that first offer. So we'll, we'll obviously clarify that over the next couple of weeks. In regards to the RFPs, uh, we really kind of say it in the notes there, there's two big RFPs that we want to make sure folks are aware of. One is the next generation K through 12 internet. That's an open procurement. Uh, the posting on that schedule to close the end of this month and uh, you know, it's really as much as I can probably say about that. Um, so uh, being that it is an open procurement activity, I think everybody's aware of it. The other one uh, that is in the initial planning is the uh, next generation seek, uh, which is obviously a big deal. That is the, the system or multiple systems, however you want to describe it. Uh, multiple uh, things contribute to uh, that uh, overall, again, system made up of multiple things that handles all the uh, allocation of funding to schools uh, based on their uh, attendance of students. So big deal there and uh, so that'll be a big effort and we've got folks uh, again involved in the initial planning of that. Thank you, Mike. Uh, Didi, uh, the K-12 data systems update. I know we have some go soapbox questions four, five and six that you may want to bring up as well. Yes, we do. Uh, we do have, Marty, you gonna bring those up? You want me to? I got it. Yeah, oh. I'll do it while you talk. This is school report card time. So uh, if you are involved in the school report card, uh, you're probably well aware of all the dates and requirements. Uh, we do have a technology portion that probably most of you are involved in uh, that is part of the data collection. The system is open between until September 16th. Uh, there is potential it could be extended a little bit, but I don't think we've got a lot of opportunity to extend long. So we do want to make sure that we do get our technology data entered. Uh, we will uh, have that information available for the digital readiness um, work that allows us to collect some school level data we wouldn't otherwise have. Um, so we've we are strategically using that uh, data collection to help with that work. So we do want to make sure that folks are doing that. Um, it looks like from what I'm seeing, Marty, I'm not seeing your screen, so I'm going to share. Okay, uh, so what I'm seeing, uh, Many of you have started it, um, but some of you are not sure. So uh, do please check on that. If you think normally you wouldn't have anything to do, and if you want to switch to the next school report card slide, many of you don't have anything to do with school report card, but this is one area that I would encourage you to make sure, even if you don't have responsibility for entering the data, make sure what the schools are entering for their technology, it does align with what you expected to do and what your district numbers are because if the, and that's the first thing that people are going to look at and say well the, the numbers don't match they're not anywhere close so try to prevent that and look at the data that's being entered by the schools if you don't have access um, to the school report card most of you are wapox and there is a school report card web page out there that you know has the user guide on there so you can assign yourself rights uh, to the site to be able to see exactly what the district center there is a download report that you're able to just download everything, even for those big big schools where you don't want to look at it individually. So do take some time to look at the school report card data. And and Didi, Didi, if I could mention real quick on that note, um, and actually a strategy that uh, our field staff team has shared um, from many of our school districts is to uh, through the digital readiness and the inventory process to uh, make sure that our school leaders who are entering school report card information, like we we give them the information to input um, and not, so it's a it's kind of a reverse strategy of what you just mentioned of checking to make sure it's more of like, hey, here's here's your, you know, response to these questions for your specific school. And right. that's what is proving to work like really, really well. Okay, great, thank you. 
So uh, another thing that is another big data collection every year is the civil rights data collection. And you may be somewhat involved in that. And you can, you know, the good news is the uh, collection is over finally for the 2021 school year. Um, you think, well, that was a long time ago, but the Department of Education has been following up with uh, districts and that's now done. Uh, the not so good news is this is another data collection year. So we will have another collection back to back years this year. So make sure that folks in your district, if somebody's retired that's done in the past, uh, or whatever that we're looking for, that person that's going to be your civil rights data collection person going forward. We do have a new um, uh, offering uh, in Infinite Campus. Uh, KDE has partnered with Infinite Campus to offer the Campus Analytics Suite to all districts free of, free of charge. So uh, districts are probably familiar with the early warning system, which has been uh, used for a while. They're also familiar with data health check that we got when we did the campus learning and online registration. We opened that up. But there are other tools in there, data visualizations, data reporting, survey tools that um, are going to be very uh, good for districts to have access to, but they might not know a lot about it. So we've got some training scheduled on the 20th. We've got a morning and afternoon session. It's the same content in both sessions. Please try to encourage folks to attend that. We're also with, working with Infinite Campus to uh, design some new analytics that will be offered through that suite so that, you know, whether, it, you know, you'd have a broader audience access to this data. Uh, there's some powerful data Infinite Campus, and we're really trying to always use that data to spur action and make that data relevant um, uh, and more helpful to you in ways. So we have um, an, a reminder on e-transcripts. Uh, as you know, we use e-transcripts for all high schools in Kentucky and post-secondary schools do expect that, uh, their transcripts to come that way. They are free, they're subsidized by um, KDE, uh, KIA this year, so last year they'll be participating in the Council for Post-Secondary Education. So the three agencies have worked and partnered with e-transcripts for a number of years. We will um, continue to do that you know, ongoing, but for this year, uh, the reminder is August 30th is the end date for the uh, subsidized transcripts. So students can get free transcripts through August 30th if they've already graduated, they graduated last year. But after that date, there will be a charge for each transcript that they get. So students that are trying to get into college and they're a little late for the game, they have another week, but their time is running out for the free transcripts. And then I want to mention some training opportunities. Uh, we've got uh, some parchment e-transcript training. If you search on our website for the cases training, you'll find links to this information. We also have some trainings that are coming up from the Department of Education on privacy and security. So I, there was a question about that. Uh, encourage folks in your districts to watch those trainings. Those go a little bit more in depth than what uh, we were able to do in the time we had with PTAC um, this spring, but that training still is available out in the department, uh, out in campus community. So if you do, haven't watched that training, it's still available, but this goes a little bit more in depth and it's really important for folks to stay abreast of some of the best practices that are available uh, and shared in these trainings. So that's all I've got, David. Probably Thank you, Didi. All right. Appreciate it. Uh, I did want to, before Bob talks about cybersecurity, I saw a note um, in the discussion question, uh, and I think the response there, and it's going back to our first topic, and this happened, this was the kind of reach out that we got uh, in Western Kentucky. So if you have surplus Chromebooks and access points, um, let your uh, your regional uh, CATS engineer be aware of that. Uh, they will coordinate that with Courtney and the sites that, in, uh, that she's working with in Eastern Kentucky that have a need for that. Obviously, I you know, saw a report, Courtney, that you sent to me late last night, you know, talking about uh, uh, some Chromebooks and access points going to, I think, Nod and Letcher County. But I do remember that happening um, with the Western Kentucky site. And what was neat is dur during the pandemic, I remember Eastern Kentucky districts going to far Western Kentucky, deliver some things back. And now Western Kentucky districts are going to Eastern Kentucky to help out. That's just wonderful, uh, wonderful type of stuff. So if you have some of those extra ones, you can at least uh, temporarily loan them. Uh, or maybe full-time give to them that make us, uh, you know, make your your uh, your person aware of that, your your regional KE aware of that. I think that was the response that was given. And Letcher County kind of talked about um, uh, with the insurance part that insurance may not cover everything. Um, you know, so um, that's where does FEMA 
uh, does come into play with certain situations where they replace things to where it's not covered by insurance, but it takes longer. Although people are trying to speed that up. So school building that may have to be replaced. Definitely there are uh, a couple, uh, maybe one for sure, maybe two I'm for sure. It's not have to be completely replaced. Uh, you know, the insurance, and they didn't have flood insurance, but FEMA helps out with the replacement of that. And I'm sharing the, the, the things within the building as well as on with the technology it covers, but it's just a longer process uh, you have to go through to get that covered. Uh, Bob, on their cybersecurity health, uh, health check update, I know we walk the talk. We, as you say, we try to always say we try to eat the same dog food and drink the same champagne that districts do. Uh, the things that we require you of all, we require of ourselves. And actually, we try to do it first. And, and uh, our cybersecurity health check was given to our, our, our commissioner and to our board. Uh, ours is more, pro is more expansive than your all's. Is it just doesn't cover KDNC, but we give them a health check view of the entire state of all the districts. So, Bob, I'll turn it over to you. Anything else you want to add on that? Sure, yeah. Um, some of the information that we also provide, um, and we don't get into details, but we do talk about the numbers of data breaches um, across the K-12 uh, arena here in Kentucky, which I think is super important for our, our board to understand that. And we also use it as an opportunity, David, to advocate for things that we don't or aren't doing yet or don't have the money to do. And, and we kind of give them an opportunity to to kind of understand where we think we're strong and where we think we're not as strong. And so that uh, they have a, a chance to kind of react to that and ask us questions. And I think that's a, a huge benefit of doing this. So if you're a, a CIO and I see we've got about 5% who haven't done this yet, haven't submitted this to your board. Uh, if you're a new CIO and haven't heard of it, um, you know, we've got some information we can send you, but I would encourage you to look at this not as one more thing to do, but a tremendous opportunity to get yeah. folks aware of this in your in your district. If you can bring up that question, I think it's question one, poll results. Um, for those that, that that maybe not on Go Soapbox, it's like 95% are that you shot oh, clock at the door, right? It's 31 August. And this, yep. is, this is not us required. This is by law. And um, one of the things that I would say is that if, if you feel the need to um, provide information as we do about where your most sensitive information and data are. That's not something you might want to share in a public forum, but you do have the legal authority to provide that in a, uh, a closed door environment with your board so that they can understand just how many systems you're protecting, you know, exactly how are you protecting them? How are you not protecting them that you really wish you were? Uh, and, and so that can happen as well. And I encourage you to make use of that uh, ability that you have to speak with your board on your own uh, in that closed door environment. You don't want to give the cyber criminals um, ammunition. So even for our board, there's we give a summary that's not uh, a high level one, that's not a problem if it got out, but we always say that you, we, you can meet with Bob and myself uh, to go over the details and, uh, in, a, in a closed session. And so I'd encourage you to do the same thing. That's right. And David, um, you know, one of the, the graphics that I've used here recently is um, something that kind of shows exactly how education has been targeted versus uh, some other industries. And, and if it's OK with you, I'd like to uh, yeah, present that right now. And we, we included these in our um, this came up in our board of education meeting, a uh, board chair, Lou Young, who's awesome board chair. Um, when I talked about a variety of things in education technology, I did point this one out. And she was really surprised that K-12 is targeted more than healthcare. Uh, a lot of that has to do with the money that's available, especially the federal money, our helping uh, nature, uh, maybe our trusting nature. Uh, typically, uh, K-12 is much more decentralized and everybody doing their own thing which make them right for targets for cyber criminals. And obviously we have more of a uh, team approach here in Kentucky that significantly reduces, and I don't want to uh, encourage any cyber attackers out there, but significantly reduces they're successful. Even though we, we see a lot of attempts, they're being successful. So our product standards that we have in place with products and design standards service very well in a variety of ways, including for cyber attacks. So even though this is really high, uh, it is not as high, uh, I mean, I, Bob, I know you have a chart that kind of shows, you know, Kentucky snapshot. I do, and I'll show that here in just a second. I also want to throw out there that a lot of these other um, industries have uh, 
high degrees of compliance they have to meet for security and privacy. And K-12 across the, the nation, it's a little more piecemeal. And so when you can in, introduce standards and things like that, you're going to see an increase in security by and large. Um, and, and so I think that also puts a target on our back where, where uh, other folks um, get passed over. Now, the latest data that I have that show all of, of the states together goes from 2005 to 2019 and but I still think this is really this is recent enough to to be impactful and you can see that um, California is the huge section here and there's a lot of different reasons for that there's tons of people in California and if you you squint really hard you can see Kentucky up there at the very top I have to blow it up or else you can't even see the the little fin that is Kentucky and this is uh, records exposed by data breaches by state over that time frame. And so when you want to kind of compare yourself, how are we doing compared to other states in terms of uh, education data records? You know, this is a great slide to kind of show that we're, we're doing pretty well, I think. And, and again, as David said, we don't want to encourage anyone to come at us to, to you know, move us a little further down on that list. But... I think it's important for us to see where we're at. Um, a lot of the states that I know are uh, even smaller than we are. Um, you know, there are some some concerns about data reporting uh, there. You know, Kentucky does a really good job of reporting our data breaches. We we have laws that require us to do so, and um, and I think that this is a a great chart to kind of sh show us where we are and and uh, the the work we're doing is is worthwhile. I'm going to bring up the uh, question six. This is, you know, you, you and Didi kind of help double team the privacy part of this. Um, uh, question six, can we bring that up about the training? Yes, just a second. Got yeah, it on. Pulling, pulling it up right now. Oh, okay. okay. Thank you. You should see it now. Yep, see it. Thank you. Thank you, Marty. Yeah. Yeah, these are these are well done and uh, encourage you to have yourself or someone to take a look at these. Um, and and pri privacy is closely related to cybersecurity. I mean, they're close close cousins, wouldn't you say, Bob? I mean, they're all they're, oh, they're buddies. Cousins. Yeah. So if, if you're you know responsible to cybersecurity, privacy is right, really a closely related topic. Probably can't have too much privacy without some cybersecurity. Yeah. Thanks, Bob. And I'll, uh, as I always say, um, and I tell uh, the, the folks watching, I do think we do have the best uh, Kentucky K-12 uh, cybersecurity officer in the United States for K-12, and that's Bob Hackworth. And I is recognized in front of our board and to our commissioner for that. So, Bob, thank you for your outstanding service to our state and many different capacities you've had as a teacher, as a, as a, one of our regional KEs, leading the birth of our virtual high school, leading the birth of state long tunnel data system and now a cybersecurity officer. So thank you. You're welcome. I'm very flattered. Thank you. Still all war. This is another fun thing. This is a super fun thing. So yesterday, uh, if you could stop sharing so wherever that is, Stop sharing that uh, that graphic. Thank you. So yesterday, they came in. Yes. Gold. Jeff, you, you must feel like a proud papa. Thank you for the, the design of that. Yes, very nice. Nice little, you know, the case they come in. Um, so our Stillwell Meritorious Service Medal, and really nice design, and you really, uh, just like any really good good metal, you, you bring it to light and you see the details behind it. So thank you for all those that uh, that uh, made that happen and got it in. So it's the time is time is to come. So um, Katie has Katie has sent a communication uh, uh, to the superintendents and CIOs about this. Um, it came from our commissioner to your superintendents to announce this, and obviously I've announced it uh, in a couple of different settings. Um, 
As I mentioned uh, in the note, the Kentucky Board of Education member, Lee Todd, who is a fantastic champion of the Kentucky Education Technology Systems, STLP, going back to the 1990s, um, was the one that gave this in the good news session of our state board meeting. Um, you talk about a great advocate and a great uh, um, Kentuckian from a lot of different aspects as Lee Todd from being an entrepreneur and having his own businesses established, MIT grad, and then president of the University of Kentucky and now still helping out. So it was it was really cool to have him uh, make that announcement. Uh, on October, on September 6th, and this is for the OET staff that are watching, uh, we will be handing out these coins in person to you. Um, and we'll be taking a, 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 an individual photo as, uh, with, with me, giving them to you um, with the announcement of your name. And then we'll take a team photo of all of us together. A couple of different purposes of that is, so we're gonna have a, a, a Bill Stilwell Red Suspenders Day. And we'll pick that day in September, October. It's gonna be the celebration of Kentucky K-12 Ed Tech. So those that have red suspenders and, and uh, can wear them and go get them, they're pretty inexpensive to go out there and get those and we can point to the places to get them uh, yourself and then showing your coins uh, as well. We want to, to use it for that day. On that same day on September 6th, our OET field staff will be picking up the, the medals and coins that will be intended to be delivered to the districts. Uh, and during the, the, the month of September, uh, our, 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 our field staff will be delivering those in a variety of ways to the district staff. And that what we're hoping to do much like it was a really cool experience for our entire Board of Education in front of our commissioner and all the rest of the, uh, the KD leadership staff and those that were watching that, uh, that event is to hear the cool things of why folks are being recognized. And so if you can bring up the ghost soapbox question around this, um, which was it about uh, your interest in us creating something uh, for you to, um, uh, to read off and, and be read at your board meeting. Um, yeah, so uh, Marty, uh, we were talking about this yesterday. So we're we're creating something or somebody's already created something. So one of you mentioned that to me yesterday in our staff meeting. Yes, um, so David, we're, we have a, a proclamation uh, that we have drafted. And, you know, the idea is that uh, because this is such a special opportunity and as really a recognition, um, as you mentioned, for our uh, ed tech leaders and, and our, all of our folks involved with uh, going above and beyond to ensure um, that, our, that our students have the opportunity that they need to continue to move forward during a really rough patch. Um, that, you know, obviously we're still working through, um, but uh, we have a proclamation drafted that we wanted to, you know, the idea is that every, you know, board would read that proclamation, including the names um, of the team members that the coin uh, locally is um, being handed to. Uh, so so it's, a, it's a great idea to kind of get that scheduled if you can. Uh, we know that some board meetings are the second week of the month, some of the third, and, and so there's not a full alignment throughout uh, a single month, but uh, over the next several weeks to work towards planning that out would be, would be awesome. And there's nothing saying much like our board read off something, but way before the coins came in, there's nothing saying that in the second week or third week of September, mm -hmm. you you can read that proclamation. You can you can say the coins will soon be delivered to them if you don't already have them. Uh, so you don't have to really wait till October to to have that done. You could you could do that in September. So we'll have that available to you. I encourage you to do that as soon as you can to get folks to recognized. And David, you you did mention this, um, but just for the maybe uh, folks who are new. Um, are relatively new. Uh, we've in the past had a Red Suspenders Day where we celebrate um, as well um, in honor of Bill Stilwell. And we, we'll, we'll plan that out, we'll announce that date, but uh, and I, the idea there that connects and aligns um, with this um, with this honor and this with this award is that we would you know grab photos and share those out um, through social media and others uh, so we, we can continue to, to celebrate that. Thank you, Marty. The last item we have um, is a, a, a summary of highlights of the meeting I had, meeting with my peers in the same kind of position uh, across the United States. Um, I would say with me personally, the things that uh, touch me emotionally and probably get me tearing up, if anything, um, is when I see folks generally listening to each other, trying to do the right things and helping each other 
and just decency. When I see both of those or either one of those, um, it is really a moving type of thing for me. And so what, what I find is in meeting with our um, with my peers, the other states, that's exactly what happens uh, and has always happened. Um, uh, it, it, it's almost therapeutic, uh, to be honest with you. And there's a general interest in helping each other and not looking at each other um, as competitors. If we're doing something right, is not hoarding that, but sharing that. Uh, that word, those words of wisdoms or, or, or path or even products uh, with each other. It is uh, a, a, just a wonderful collaborative experience. Um, you know, and Phil Coleman, who was heavily involved with helping his brother who lives in Letcher County, uh, can can talk about is seeing that firsthand uh, of people working together during these disasters, both in Western and Eastern Kentucky, and even during the pandemic is a wonderful experience. I share this with our staff. I'm going to do a plug for two movies that if you need a dose of humanity to get your confidence back in humanity, um, uh, if you've not experienced firsthand, there are two things I encourage you to watch. Um, uh, there's only one movie I've ever watched back to back. After finishing, I watched it immediately. It's called 13 Lives. And uh, it's out by Amazon. It's about the what happened in Thailand with the, the 12 uh, young boys that got uh, stuck in a cave, uh, in a flooded cave, and their coach. And all that went through from all different people of all different backgrounds on top of that mountain, below that mountain, in that mountain to get, to get those, uh, those young men uh, back to safety. And just the precision and the bravery and the guts that it took uh, to make all that happen. So it's on Amazon Prime. Closely related to that is a National Geographic special that came out in 2021 called The Rescue. Uh, that's available on Disney Plus and I think probably some other things as well. And I, and it, once again, either one of those is just fantastic. The, the Rescue really has the real people that that did it and interviews them and reenacts a, a good portion of it. Um, plus, I'm a Andy. Griffith show fan and so Ron Howard was a director of 13 Lives so I encourage you to do that but that's the experience and the feeling I get when I go to these meetings. The states that are most like Kentucky in our approach, um, that their statewide approach to things and just philosophies, uh, since the beginning back in, in the 1992s, uh, North Carolina and Delaware uh, are states that really have a, a statewide approach and they leverage the entire state to do really cool things for the entire state and really don't leave people behind uh, and just let them fend for themselves. And that's true today. Um, that's really been consistent you know, through the years. Georgia is another state that I find similar uh, to Kentucky and Nevada. Um, Indiana uh, has a really good uh, person in my position that does some cool things. Um, Wisconsin in the past has been similar to Kentucky and Arizona is getting more similar to, to Kentucky. Good number of these states focus in on their state longitudinal data systems. Uh, they're actually, Bob Hackworth, you having led this, um, what we found in the early days, and Bob, you went through the grind of this, is when the DOE tried to house that, there was a grind from other organizations that fed data into it, workforce and um, uh, CPE in particular, and even early childhood. It says, well, it's in, it's, it's in the DOE, how you don't really represent us. And, uh, the early funding, the federal funding that, that put that in place for states, Kentucky's is, I would say, if not the most successful, uh, one of the most successful ones. And even Indiana was, was, was presenting what they're getting ready to do in Indiana with their uh, their longitudinal data system. It goes over time, it has their K-12 data, their higher ed and the workforce data, mainly for research uh, and, and, and strategic purposes. They are trying to do now what we've done for 15 years. And so most states are now trying to include workforce data, higher ed data. And of course, we've done that with Kentucky stats and it's gone through a couple of different name changes over the years. But we have an independent, there's an independent kind of organization that runs that for us. We're represented along with those other organizations. And so, uh, but Indiana did give us a high, you know, a credit for being far ahead of them, even though they presented to the rest of the states. We also share at the state level, things like RFPs, policies, we share what each one of us is paying for prices for these services. So we can use that as leverage um, as we are establishing relationships and contracts with vendors. I can tell you within Kentucky, me seeing the RFP that was for Nebraska, Nevada, and Delaware uh, helped us reduce 90% of the time in creating our own RFP. 
uh, and awarding a bid. Now, we took the greatest hits from all those RFPs. Our, our winner was not the one of their state's winner, so this wasn't grooving it in for a vendor. Um, actually, it was a different one, as I said, from those states. But it accelerated the time frame with us being willing to share what we have in place. Uh, we, I did ask on this visit I had last Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, every state goes through a calculation of this plus this divided by this equals this, you know, the amount of money that every student gets uh, per student. In Kentucky, we call that SEEK. That's a $3 billion type of service. Obviously, going back to Bob's chart, when you have that kind of money involved, cyber criminals are very, very, very interested. And so... Unlike the system that was developed here in Kentucky years ago and all other states, um, you always have to develop now newer applications with the understanding these cyber criminals are primarily targeted on education organizations. And so that, that causes us to take a different approach of making sure it's ruggedized, they it can handle people coming and going. There is a transfer and shifting of risk. Uh, and so in this case, uh, we're, we're shifting from doing it in-house to transferring the risk uh, to another organization that's responsible for building it and maintaining it, and especially as people people come and go. Uh, we found the state of uh, Nevada and Arizona are in a similar situation as us, and so we'll be working with those states and maybe a couple others that, that I talked about. They're also in the same position, Chuck, we talked about with identity management, uh, going forth with taking a look at RFP, uh, for what will be the state's uh, RF identity management approach. And so we'll also be working closely with a couple of those states that I mentioned that we have close relationships with and are most like Kentucky, Delaware, uh, North Carolina, uh, Georgia, uh, will be states that we work uh, closely with. They're taking a similar statewide approach to things. I, uh, we also find out this is for our OET staff that are heavily involved in federal reporting. Uh, the Generate tool was a tool that was created at the federal level. Uh, uh, the really cool thing is since we have a state product standard and infinite campus that all districts use, uh, once again, an edge that we have on nearly all the other states except Nevada has taken a similar approach that we have, is you can do, you can cut down your complexity and your costs by 90%, 95% when you're taking those approaches. And so what Nevada is getting ready to do is something Kentucky already did is, is, is feeding infinite campus data um, and they, they, they chose a different kind of angle to do it but and, and to generate. And so generate, by the way, for those that are involved in our staff, they're involved with that is a top priority of these other states that are now getting into the business of how can we do the federal reporting, taking advantage of the data systems that we already have in place. The FCC leadership came and, and, and spoke with our group. I'll give you the highlights of that. We mainly spoke about it from an E-rate perspective. Uh, they really feel ongoing that uh, the buses will be an E-rate eligible service. So that was a short-term type of thing. My understanding a report came out uh, by, uh, by them on Monday that we're gonna take a look at. The question I asked them is what we find in the Education Superhighway Report, um, pointed this out that the biggest problem, it's not 100%, but the biggest problem is not, is not having at least one uh, last mile connection to connect to from the home, it's not being able to afford it. That is overwhelmingly the biggest problem is the funding of an existing at least one option, or if you have two or five uh, options that are out there. There's a small percentage to where you don't even have one option, last mile wire to wireless, but the big problem is funding. So my question to them is there's a lot of funding that has been available for this last mile. Um, uh, th there was an emergency broadband uh, fund that was $50 per month for, for low-income families. Uh, it's moved to uh, what they call now ACP. Uh, what's ACP stand for? So somebody remind me of that. Um, do you, does anyone remember what that stands for? Affordable. Connectivity program. Connectivity like program. Connectivity yeah. for $30 yeah. per month. A lifeline program existed before that. That was $10 per month. So my question to... The FCC was this, um, and it was a couple of different fronts. I had a couple of different questions for them. The Lifelight program only probably had 15% of the eligible families apply for it. It's been around since the late 1990s. Now, why is that? Why is it such a low rate? Well, part of it is you have to go through a lot of effort to prove that you're poor, which is humiliating for those that are low income. But the paperwork is, is massive. 
my hopeful my hope for the ACP program was that it would be less paperwork. Unfortunately, it is not. Uh, but they tell me the adoption rate is double that of, of the Lifeline program, which is about 30 percent, which is still immensely lower. So what has recently come out and the information we'll share with you uh, is a, a funding source that allows states and districts to identify an organization that helps these low income parents not just become aware they're eligible. Um, and we know, you know, FERPA, you can't, you know, can't share, you know, the uh, pre reduced lunch information, but walks these low income parents through the paperwork process, helps them get to the finish line. That is not really a role that the districts really, you know, have been in, the need to be in is doing all the paperwork, but it's nice, this is now being recognized as one of the main issues of people adopting it. Uh, I asked also how long do they think the ACP program will last? It was eight, nine billion. Maybe that's two or three or four years at that kind of level of rate of, of, of expenditure. So my question to them was, will they beef up the Lifeline program to be higher once the ACP money rolls out? And obviously they can't commit to that, but they understand they don't want to go backwards of the gains that have been made during the pandemic, which I thought was an important problem. Every state is running into the teacher type uh, pipeline problem. And so they're looking at what technology resources and data, existing ones or ones that can be built, can identify strategies or approaches uh, that can help out with that. Uh, Medicaid reimbursement, uh, big money in Medicaid and previously, all the work you went through was not worth the reimbursement you would get, but the, new, the newly uh, federal funds uh, may make it worth districts actually applying for Medicaid uh, for certain services that are now eligible. A huge amount of states are now getting on board with Kentucky's approach we've had for the past 15 years is going to the cloud. Overwhelmingly, uh, they, are, they are moving from on-premise systems. Uh, and we've seen, we talked about before, just the benefit of that during the three big disaster we've had with the pandemic, the tornado and the floods. They're recognizing the weakness of having on-premise systems and the value of moving to cloud-based systems. So that's the update from the CCSSO, very therapeutic uh, type, type of thing. Um, um, we'll, we'll stop right there. Appreciate everyone joining us being in the school year. I'll stay on here a real lot real longer with some bonus time, just having some uh, some conversations and uh, once again appreciate what everyone's doing out there on our OET staff on in district staff and have a good beginning of the school year take care